Hi, I'm Mary from the Maryland Room, and this is a Frederick County Public Library's genealogy moment. The pedigree chart, also known as an ancestry chart, is one of the major tools we use in genealogy. Also, a finished pedigree chart, if we ever finish our genealogy journey, is one of our major end products. Um, by utilizing a pedigree chart, whether you use paper or use it online, it allows you to have a quick snapshot of your research. Um, many, we do many other things in our research than just filling in a pedigree chart, but a pedigree chart allows us to really take a quick look at what we're lacking on the chart. What people are we missing? What information about those people are we missing? Who don't we have their birth date for, or death date for, or marriage date for? Um, whose names do we not have completely? The pedigree chart gives us quick access to that information. Also, if we turn it sideways, it gives us our family tree. Um, you can just very clearly see from start with the person whose chart you're starting with up to the many leaves which are their ancestors so the pedigree chart can be a really really useful tool it's also a good tool to use to share your information with other people whether you're sharing it with your own immediate family or sharing it with that fifth cousin you met on Facebook or whether or not you're sharing it with some genealogist who you ran into when out in the world when we're able to go out into the world and who you are share your trials and tribulations of your research journey with um, so it's a really good tool and it's such an important tool that there are certain conventions that it's important to follow in order to make the chart more understandable for anyone who's going to look at it. Um, not only to make it more understandable to yourself, I'm sure we've all had the experience where we took notes, whether it's class notes or wrote something now we need to get the grocery store, and two hours later, two years later, we have no idea what we wrote down or what it means. So if we follow good conventions, it's easier to understand it for ourselves and again when we're sharing it with other people. And we do our genealogy not only for ourselves and for our own gratification and for our own hobby and for our own um, understanding of the past and how we and our family fit into the past, but also by doing genealogy, we're laying the groundwork for other genealogists who come after us. Of course, um, you never should copy anyone else's pedigree chart, whether you find it online or in a book. Um, it should be a clue, just like every other clue you may find in genealogy. Um, you don't ever trust anyone's work but your own. But still, people who are coming after you looking at a good pedigree chart that you put together will help them on their journey and provide clues for their own research and a base for their own research as well. So there's three major conventions um, we'd like to talk about today that I think you'll find useful to integrate into your own practice of doing genealogy and creating your own um, pedigree charts, whether again you're doing it a line or doing it on a piece of paper or on a formal pedigree chart or doing it in a, in a quilt. I mean, pedigree charts can be created in many different things. We can create family trees in decoupage. We can do many different things with family trees. But again, they are the groundwork, they are the base, the roots, again, of our genealogy travels. So the first thing to keep in mind when you're putting information on your pedigree chart is how you record women, okay? When we record women on our pedigree chart, it's very important to use their maiden names, their birth names, not their married names. When you're looking through documents, um, it doesn't take very long to go back several generations where women will also vanish into the document types. Once a woman got married, she frequently, usually lost her last name and sometimes also she lost her first name. It's not that uncommon to even take a look at a mid 20th century obituary, which was not that long ago, and you'll see Mrs. Bob Jones down just as Mrs. Bob Jones. Um, you won't know what her first name was or her maiden name or her parents or the rest of her um, her blood family, who they were. Um, and of course, this then she loses her identity on your tree, but not only does she lose your identity on your tree and also then lose her identity in regards to your own family history, but also it makes researching further back almost impossible if you don't know what her maiden name was. You don't know the names of her parents or her brothers or her grandfather. It makes it very, very difficult, if not impossible, which is why often when you go back um, several generations, researching the female line is considered very difficult at times. Not all the time, but sometimes it can be very difficult. Um, when I work with school groups, they often would just do the paternal line because it's so much easier, but it's only half the story. And obviously um, we, are, we are the results of both sides of our family, both the male and female. And on our charts and in our families, you know, female have equality and we wanna make sure the females, no matter how far back they go, have whatever identity we can give them. So things to remember, first of all, is always when you're recording the female on your pedigree chart, use their birth name, also known as their maiden name, but not their married name. Otherwise, when people look at your chart, they're going to be thinking, oh, the, oh your family and cousins are always marrying other cousins. Um, if you don't know her maiden name or their maiden names at various times, 
leave it blank or just put a little line, like a straight line through showing that you don't know that yet, um, but don't fill in their, maiden, their married names because it's just gonna cause confusion for other people when they look at your chart. Even if you think it's very clear to you, um, you never know when someone else is gonna be utilizing your chart. And again, you wanna follow the best guidelines you can and record information as accurately as you can to save yourself time and also to give you clues and to allow you to have uh, better tools for researching the future, okay? Secondly is how you record dates on your pedigree chart. Okay, this is the convention that's normally followed when we're looking, um, when we're doing pedigree charts. We do the day, the month, the year. Okay, no commas necessarily. Um, it's not the way most of us record dates, but it is the standard format for doing in genealogy. So again, when you're putting a birth date, a marriage date, a death date down, you want to put the day, the month, and the year. And when you're doing the year, you want to make sure you put all four numbers of the year. Even if you know what century you're dealing with, make sure you put all four numbers. So you know, for example, that grandma was born in 1935, not 1835. But if you just put 35 down, someone else looking at your chart may quickly go, what century are you talking about? Or again, if someone's looking at your chart 100 years from now, even get all more confusing. So again, when you record women, you wanna make sure you use their birth names, their maiden names, not their married names. If you don't know their married names, just leave that part blank. And when you record the date, you wanna make sure it's day, month, year. Okay. The third thing to keep in mind when you're doing a genealogy chart is how you record place. Okay. As in many things in life, location, location, location is very important in family history research. This is because where the event occurred at the time it occurred is where you're going to go looking for the records. Okay. I think the best example of that is that, um, from, if we all recall from middle school Civil War history is, for example, West Virginia. West Virginia came out of Virginia. So before 1863, if you're looking for records relating to some part of West Virginia, you're going to be looking in Virginia. And this is not an oddity, you know, um, Cities change their boundaries, counties change their boundaries, states change their boundaries, countries change their boundaries. Um, so it's important to know when that event occurred, when someone was born somewhere, when someone was married somewhere, when someone died somewhere, what was the legal jurisdiction of that place at that time? Because again, that's when you're gonna go be looking for the records. You know, Frederick County came out of Prince George's County, Montgomery County, Carroll County, Washington County came out of Frederick County. So again, using Harper's Ferry as an example, if your family was in Harper's Ferry for 200 years and always in the same house, in the same place, where you look for the records will differ. So if they were there in that house in pre-1863, before West Virginia was made a state, if you're looking for records that occurred in Harper's Ferry, West Virginia, you're gonna go to Virginia. So when you record that information down in your pedigree chart, you wanna put the municipality, the name of the place, the county of the place, because again, county boundaries change as well, and then you want to put down the state at the time the event occurred. So they lived in that house in 1862, and you're looking for marriage records. You're going to be going to Virginia, okay? Someone got married in that exact same house three years later, and you're post-1863. You're going to be going to West Virginia to look for those records. So um, and again, this is important for that reason, because that is where you're going to be going to look for the records um, in the locations where they occurred. When states are created, when counties are created, um, the old states, the old counties normally don't give the new municipalities, the new places, the records, they keep them for themselves. So that's where you're going to need to go. So the three things to keep in mind when you're working on your pedigree chart is, first of all, again, when you record women, include use their birth names and their maiden names, not their married names. OK, when you're recording date, you want to record it day, month, year. OK, and with year, all four numbers. OK, and then for place, again, location, location, location. You want to put it down as it existed at the time the event occurred. And you want to record the name of the place, the county, as it was at that time, and also then the state as it was at that time. And always keep West Virginia in mind because um, we learned about West Virginia in elementary school and middle school. So hopefully that is in our heads and it makes it very clear the distinction that boundaries change, places change. So please um, keep in mind those three things when you use your pedigree chart. I think it'll make your genealogy journeys easier. Um, thank you for joining us here today, and we'll see you next time at the next Frederick County Public Library's Genealogy Moment.